Hi, it's the MLM for the Soul Channel. I do have a new topic for today. Before I begin, I just would like to say, may the words and expressions of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of my heart find favor and acceptance before you, Hashem. And this is the continuation of the Mesilah Sisharim, which is called the Way of the Upright or the Path of the Just by the Ramchal or of Moshe Chaim Lutzato. And it's from the Art School Yaffa edition. And I will have um, a link below to Art School. And this is what the Sefer looks like if you've never seen it. And this is part number 61 on a new chapter, Baruch Hashem. This is chapter 15. It's the way to acquire parishus, which is defined as abstinence. Now, this chapter is a little bit longer, but it's it's not very long in the sense that I'm planning, Bezat Hashem, to do the whole chapter in this one video, which will mean that, that the, um, <clears throat> the video will be a little bit longer. Um, I don't know about the upcoming chapter afterwards, but we'll see how that goes. Okay, so the, again, chapter 15, the way to acquire precious. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the best way to acquire the trait of precious, uh, commentary here says, although there are three aspects of life to which precious can be applied, as described in the previous chapter, the focus in this chapter is on the first aspect, which is that of abstaining from non-essential physical pleasures. Okay, so he says that the best way to acquire it is for a person to reflect on the deficient nature of the pleasures of this world and their lowliness in and of themselves, as well as the great evils that are likely to result from indulging in them, as will be explained below. And commentary here says Ramchal identifies three critical flaws in worldly pleasures. They are deficient in the sense that enjoyment is minimal and short-lived. They are base and inferior due to their material nature and they can eventually cause physical harm to the body. So those are the three flaws, he says. And as Ramchal explains further, concentrating on these truths until they become one's mindset fosters an easier transition to a life of precious. Meaning, <clears throat> if you can concentrate and keep focusing on these three flaws, you know, that the enjoyment is minimal, that they're just inferior, you know, because they're material nature and they can cause harm, it'll eventually get you to basically come to that, uh, you know, precious of, of absence. Okay, and he continues. Ramchal elaborates on the effectiveness of this technique. This method is effective because the force that sways one's nature towards these worldly pleasures to the point that it requires so much willpower and so many tactics to separate one's nature from them is the seductive effect of worldly delights on the eyes which are seduced by the external appearance of things by which every pleasure seems to be good and pleasing, i.e. one is drawn to what he sees. In fact, this is the seductive effect that causes the very first transgression, transgression to be committed, i.e. Adam and Chava eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. As scripture testifies in relating how Chava succumbed to eating of the fruit, Gracious 3.6, uh, the woman saw that the tree was good for eating and that it was a delight for the eyes. Quote, etc. And she took of its fruit and ate. And the commentary here says Ramchal means to illustrate that the first sin is indicative of all sins involving physical desire. That a person is tempted by what he sees. And then it says also see Sparta to brace us through one. So meaning the eyes saw it and then you know you crave it and want it. You desire it. Okay I'm saying that. Okay and he continues on. Likewise every attraction to worldly pleasures begins with the activity's visual effect on its beholder. And commentary here says in other words, physical desire is based less on reality, on an object's or activity's actual capacity to give pleasure than on the observer's perception. The vision of worldly pleasures provokes in the human mind an alluring image that it is out of all proportion to reality. This in turn triggers physical impulses that reinforce the illusion by making the pleasure seem very real and tangible, even vital. I'm drawing on this deep Insight into human desire, Ramchal proposes a means of conquering it as he proceeds to explain, and he will explain. But there's also an additional commentary. Before I get to that, I just want to say, so that's what it is, is, you know, you see it and you perceive it as a certain way, but really it's, what I'm getting at is really it's an illusion. It's not really what you think it is, but you're, you're perceiving it to be that way or you're imagining you want it to be that way. That's how it goes. So the additional commentary here is from Base Lady, Parsha Spiracious, um and Daf He Masechet Sota, provides a remarkable illustration of this concept with regard to the pursuit of money. A person is willing to endure the harshest of weather conditions, knowingly jeopardizing his health just to make a few rubles. But oddly, the same person would readily spend a fortune on doctors when he is sick, thus sacrificing the very money he earned. 
This is because while pursuing money, a person's mind conjures up the most wonderful images of the joy and happiness this money will bring, such that the risk to his health pales in comparison. But when it comes to money, the person already has stripped of any illusion why he knows full well that his health is worth more. So there you go. He's giving that uh, interesting uh, illustration. Okay, and he continues on. So now, however, when it becomes clear to a person through constant reflection that this, quote, good is utterly fictitious, meaning that it's illusory, illusory and without any real endurance. Commentary here says Ramchal clarifies his uses of the word kozev as denoting two ideas. Um, I think that was a word. I don't know if that was a word he mentioned earlier. Um, I didn't see it here, but I don't know where that comes in. But okay. As denoting two ideas. One, that the attractions are illusory, illusory and deceptive, i.e. blown out of proportion. As in divrei chazam, meaning speakers of deception from Tehillim 5.7. And two, that even whatever good feeling they provide is fleeting and elusive. As in kamo achsav maim lo ne'em manu. Let's just give you the word so you know what it is in Hebrew. Like an intermittent stream like unfaithful water. And that's from Yermio 15.18. And I don't know where this w word um, kozev came in, maybe. It was in Hebrew somewhere earlier that I didn't um, get, but okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. All right, so continuing on. Um, so whereas the evil inherent in it is real due to its base nature, or evil is likely to result from its real in reality, such as in the form of ill health, the person will surely come to despise it and not desire it at all. Um, and this, this then is the entire practice which a person must train his mind if he wishes to overcome temptation and acquire parishas, to recognize the feebleness of these worldly pleasures and their falsehood. See, that's the, that's the hard part, I guess, for people to overcome. That it's, you know, it's just, that's just what it is. But he's, he's saying it pretty blatantly, that's what you have to do. And he continues on, he must reinforce this recognition until he flex reflexively despises these pleasures and it will not be difficult in his eyes to cast them away from himself as he will not feel deprived if he does not have them. And commentary here says, to disarm the evil inclination of its seductive powers, one must drill into his psyche that appearances deceive. Once one views the anticipated pleasure realistically and moreover brings the hidden pitfalls to light, the temptation to indulge will fade and may even be replaced by aversion to such indulgence. Meaning, saying eventually, this is me saying, eventually this, is, he sees it, they see it all as a deception, this pleasure. It's not really what they think it is and it's really all, you know, uh, it fades away and it's all an illusion and you're no, not even interested in it anymore. Okay, and the commentary here says, the Ram, uh, additional commentary says, the Rambam in Hilchos Deos 415 writes, Excessive eating is like poison for the body. It is the source of all illness. For the majority of illnesses that afflict a person are caused either by eating unhealthy food or by eating in excessive amounts, even if the food itself is nutritious. As Shlomo Melech in his great wisdom said in Mishle 21-23, he who guards his mouth and tongue guards himself from suffering. That is to say, he guards his mouth from taking in food that would be bad for his health. And he guards his tongue from idle speech. Okay, and he continues on. So now the Ramchal provides an example of the fleeting and potentially harmful nature of worldly pleasures. Consider of all worldly pleasures, the pleasure of eating is the most tangible and palpable. But is there anything more short-lived and perish perishable than the fleeting pleasure of eating? Why, the pleasure lasts only as long as the food is contained in the eater's throat. Once it leaves the throat and descends into the digestive tract, any memory of the tasted food is lost, and it is forgotten as if it never existed. As to the feeling of satiety that remains, a person is equally sated whether he eats a delicious delicacy such as fattened geese or he ate coarse whole meal bread, if he had eaten enough of the bread to satisfy his hunger. This lesson is all the more compelling if one considers the many illnesses that may afflict him due to his unhealthy eating habits, or if he at least considers the uncomfortable feeling of heaviness that comes over him after excessive eating, as well as the fumes, i.e. the drowsiness-inducing properties that will dull his mind. Why, with all of these considerations, a person surely will not desire this indulgence, since its good effect is not truly good, whereas its bad effect is truly bad. And there's commentary here, but I just want to say, so this is what he's saying. It's like, you know, you're enjoying eating, but only while it's in your mouth. Once it leaves your mouth, the enjoyment is finished. There's no pleasure anymore. So basically, you can, if you think about it that way, then you won't overeat. You'll just eat what you need, is what I'm looking at. So the commentary here says, so Ramchal introduces this strategy as, quote, the best way to acquire parishas. 
implying that there is another less effective way. What other method did he have in mind? Perhaps it is the strategy of contemplating the spiritual dangers posed by the various kinds of pleasures as described in chapter 13. <laughs> Excuse me. Such contemplation is certainly helpful, but it does little to weaken one's instinctive desires and thus would leave a person in a state of endless conflict between the higher and lower aspects of his being. By contrast, the method presented here dampens one's base desires by exposing the fallacies on which they are based, allowing one to attain a relatively struggle-free precious. That's from Pesach Ha'iyon, Pesach HaMesila. I don't know what that is, but okay, that's what is mentioned in parentheses. Okay, now he continues on. So the same considerations apply to other worldly pleasures as well. All the other worldly pleasures um, are the same as the pleasure associated with food. If one contemplates their nature, he will see that even that illusor, illusory good feeling that one derives from indulging in them lasts only for a short while, whereas the ill effect that can result from them is rather harsh and protracted, so that it is unbecoming of any sensible person to subject himself to the potentially bad risks. For the paltry benefit of that ins insignificant, quote, good, this is obvious. Commentary here. Some of the, quote, otherworldly pleasures alluded to in this paragraph are mentioned in the previous two chapters, conjugal relations, elegant dress, and conversation. In each case, the pleasure lasts only for the duration of the experience. Afterward, the good feeling dissipates, while any negative consequences derived from the experience directly or even just from the expense incurred, such as in the case of extravagant clothing, can reach far into the future. Keeping this reality in mind will ease the task of withdrawing from such pleasures. And additional commentary. When evaluating the true worth of physical pleasures, it is also helpful to compare their fleeting nature and the inevitable regret over the negative side effects to the lasting satisfaction derived from performing a good deed. When a person passes a difficult moral test or helps a fellow in a significant way, the good feeling from having done the right thing can last a lifetime. The striking contrast alone should lead a thoughtful person to recognize the fallacy of earthly pleasures and the genuine goodness of mitzvah performance. That's from Rev. Avram J. Tursky in Lights Along the Way. Um, and it's Zechron of Racha. He did pass away, um, I think it was a few years, a couple years ago or a few years ago. But so here's what he's trying to say is that, you know, the enjoyment is short-lived. But, the, but if it, there's a negative effect from that, it could last forever. So, and then the opposite is true, like if you do a good deed, you know, think about the lasting effects of that, you know, meaning you help somebody and it's going to, it's beneficial, doing kindness and doing mitzvahs, so that's, um, that's a nice way to um, present that from Rabbi Torsky, that's all. Okay, um, so now he continues on, Rabbi Hal concludes his approach to acquiring precious. When a person accustoms himself and consistently contemplates this truth, then little by little he will free himself from the shackles of folly with which the physical nature of his being binds him. And he will no longer be tempted by the lures of such deceptive pleasures. And the uh, commentary here says that Ramchal points, Ramchal's points regarding the fleeting, deceptive, and often painful nature of worldly desires are well known. And they generally come to the force once the person has satiated his desire and his physical impulses have calmed. Still, when faced with a desire again, a person once more falls prey to his power of imagination and his desire overpowers what he knows to be true. This is not simple ignorance, but willful ignorance and foolishness. The powerful impulses of man's physicality overwhelm his intellect to the point where it is virtually in shackles. Ramchal explains that by constantly asserting one's intellect and conditioning one's mind to perceive the true nature of these illusory desires, one can throw off these shackles and maintain the steady dominance of the intellect. So he's saying, yeah, um, again, this is me expounding on it. You know, you, you, you overcome it and then you fall prey to it again. You get, to, you know, like pulled into it, tempted by it. And then, you know, you have to work on overcoming it. And you don't want to be like he's saying in shackles, like it's, it's, it's holding on to you. You know, so, but if you, if you get your mind to the point where you realize they're just, it's just an all an illusion, it's all fake, you can get rid of that. Okay, um, and then he continues on. On the contrary, he will then despise them and have freed himself from the, quote, shackles of folly, like he just said. He will recognize that he ought not to partake of this world except that which is essential to his well-being, which is the essence of precious, as I have written in the previous two chapters. 
and a commentary here says essentially the trade of priest just means that one approaches the physical world as a reality with which he must engage but not any as a means of pleasure and satisfaction um and he says see chapter 13 and 14 you can always go back to the videos i'm not going back there but okay so the awareness that its pleasures are fleeting will naturally bring one to engage the physical world with a with precious taking from it only what is necessary keep in this keeping the interaction with the physical to a minimum and to mindful interaction not interaction driven by desire provide a safe distance from sin which as Ramchal explained in chapter 13 is the purpose of precious additional commentary says here one may ask if a person cultivates an attitude of disdain towards worldly pleasures, how will he be able to enjoy them on, on Shabbat and Yom Tov when engaging them as a mitzvah? See beginning of previous chapter. That's a good question, right? So the answer is that the mindset recommended by Ramchal does not negate the pleasures altogether, but attempts only to control them to recognize that while they are beneficial in moderation when called for, such as on Shabbat, in excess they bring, bring pain and regret. The practice of precious seeks to tame the indulgence that may ultimately lead to sin. See chapter 13. Once a person cultivates an aversion to excess indulgence, he can appreciate pleasure when it is beneficial, perhaps as an occasional boost to his sense of well-being or as something to enhance the joyfulness of Shabbat and Yom Tov. He will then enjoy his food in a wholesome, responsible, and elevated way. In this vein, Ravad, um, says Baal from Bali, HaNefeshar HaKadusha, um, uh, and he writes, I see the optimal path for subduing one's yater, which is base desires, as the practice of training oneself to make do with minimal enjoyment of food and drink. The portion of food that a person does eat for his health should be well prepared and well seasoned, so that it can be pleasing to him and put his mind at ease. But always he should leave some food over, withdrawing from the urge to fulfill his desire. He must not refrain from any uh, sacred joy or pleasure, you know, eating on Shab like eating on Shabbat, Except that he should desist from completely satiating his desire and should be always alert to the Yatra's tactics. So that's a very good um, uh, information um, uh, on what to do. So meaning, I'm saying this, you know, Shabbos and Yom Tov, you're supposed to enjoy, like you buy things especially for that, and you say, I always say, L'Kuvid Shabbos, L'Kuvid Yom Tov, or even Rosh Chodesh, anything that's like a, something for a ho holy purpose, what it is is you're making everything into a mitzvah, even the food you eat. Even even during the week, I always say, also, I'm eating so I can be stronger and healthier to serve Hashem better. I'm doing a mitzvah. This is a mitzvah. I'm doing this as a mitzvah. So that changes it too. But still, you shouldn't overindulge. That's the point they're making here. Okay, and he continues on now. Just a short uh, part of this end of this chapter is called Factors That Detract from Precious. This is still part of the same chapter. So now he says... Now, just this constant reflection on this matter, i.e. the emptiness of the worldly pleasures, brings about the acquisition of precious. So too, foolish ignorance of this matter hinders one's acquisition of precious. And commentary here. Even if one seeks to practice precious by refraining from all unnecessary indulgences, if he has not internalized this truth about the illusory nature of worldly pleasures so that he sees them as meaningless, he will find himself always in conflict with his natural desires. Never really acquiring precious. And then it says, see further in Ramchal. So even if you practice it, if you don't internalize it, it you're not going to get past it. Meaning, you know, so you still have to, you know, work on that to make sure, make it part. But basically, like you said earlier, making it part of you so that, you know, you don't even feel deprived when you don't have these other indulgences that other people have because it doesn't, it doesn't matter to you. It doesn't, you don't connect with it. Okay, now he continues on. Um, another factor that attracts from acquiring precious is the practice of frequenting the company of noblemen and people of high society who pursue honor through material possessions and promote frivolousness. For when one sees that opulence and that extravagance of their lifestyle, it is not possible that his desire will not be uh, aroused to covet them. And even if he controls himself and does not allow his evil inclination to defeat him, nevertheless he will not escape the battle and he thus remains in constant spiritual danger. So he's saying... You know, meaning if you're around these people, high society, people with a lot of money or possessions, it's going to, you know, might rub, quote, quote, unquote, rub off on you. I'm saying that. So, you know, n you know, don't spend time with those kind of people. And he continues on. In this thing, Shlomo Hamel said in Kohelis 7, 2, it is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. Commentary here says a house of feasting with its buoyant ambience or ambience, um, 
or ambiance, I think, or, or maybe ambience, I don't know, <laughs> I might be pronouncing it wrong each time. Okay, and anyway, an excess, an excess of food and drink and other worldly delights naturally places one at risk of being drawn to frivolity. In contrast, the house of mourning naturally brings to focus on the true meaning of life and the futility of the pursuit of worldly delights. And although one can certainly maintain a serious focus even in the house of feasting, this requires great effort and sometimes even extreme measures. See Brachos 31a. Okay, continuing on. So the ideal setting for cultivating the practice of precious. To this end, more precious than all else is solitude. And they call, in Hebrew it's called Hidbodidut. For when one secludes himself from society, just as he removes worldly matters from his sight, so does he also remove their attraction from his heart. Meaning, what do they say? Um, you know, um, uh, out of sight, out of mind. I just that just came to me. So that that's perfect right here. And, but there is a commentary. Commentary here. This advice seems to be based on the well-known teaching: first the eyes see, then the heart desires, etc. That's a midrash Tanhumah Midbar fifteen thirty nine, cited by Rashi. Accordingly, if the eye is prevented from seeing, the heart will not come to desire. Desire. That's from Yosher Masila. See the thought of Rav Shlomo Walby cited in the inside on page 295 to 296. That was previously. I'm not going there, but that's what it says. Um, so I always like to give credit there. Now he continues on. David Amel, may peace be upon him, always noted the virtue of solitude when he said in Tehillim 55, 7 through 8. Oh, that I had wings like the dove. I would wander afar and dwell in the wilderness cella. Um, in Hebrew, it's me eating the Eber Kayona of Gomer, Hine Achik Nedod Alin Pamid Barcella, if you've heard that pretty well known verses. Uh, um, similarly, regarding the prophets Eliyahu and Elisha, we find in Malachim Aleph 19a and Malachim Bet 425 that they designated their dwelling places in the mountains because of their desire for solitude. And the early pious sages of blessed memory also followed in their footsteps. Commentary here says, such as Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and his son Rabbi Elazar, who secluded themselves in a cave for many years, see Shabbos 30b. Although they needed to escape the Roman authorities, they could have gone elsewhere, but chose the cave because of their desire for solitude. Indeed, they attained great spiritual heights during those years. As the Gemara relates, um, and that's Rav Avram ben Harambam in Hamas Pik Laovdei Hashem, chapter 13, page 291, and Yoras Devash, 114. Okay. Um, and that says from the Gemara, it's for also Shabbos 30b. Okay. And he continues on here. Let's see where I left off. Okay. Continues on. Um, and it says, because they found, it's talking about the pious sages do, they found um, this to be the means more conducive to acquiring the ultimate precious. For by secluding themselves, they ensured that the pursuit of folly by their fellows would not lead them to pursue folly as well. Thus, seclusion allowed them to integrate and maintain the correct mindset regarding worldly pleasures. And I'm just saying this for myself. Maybe that's why I love also going to the mountains or going to a place where it's quiet and peaceful and just nature and just you can connect with Hashem and all the beauty that you see. You know, and it's, it's much more conducive to getting a stronger connection to, um, to your is part of you, you know, because you're removing yourself from all these obstacles or barriers or temptations, I would say. Okay, and he continues on. Um, so the Ramchal closes with a note of caution. Among the things that one must be careful about when acquiring precious is that a person should not seek to skip and jump to the last extreme of precious in one instant, for this will surely not succeed. Rather, he should steadily withdraw himself from worldly matters little by little, one day he should acquire a small measure of precious and the next day add a little more until he becomes so completely habituated to it that it will come completely natural to him. And commentary here, in every area one should take care to improve oneself gradually, making sure to settle squarely on one step before proceeding to the next. But in the case of precious, it is essential. Too sudden a heap in acquiring, leap, sorry, I said heap. Too sudden a leap uh, in acquiring this trait when the person is not physically or emotionally ready to forego certain needs, may be very damaging to his spiritual asset. Ascent. See Yunim of Rav Yechezkel Sarna and also see Bali Hanefesh Shar Kedusha. And Rav Avram ben, ben Harambam in Hamas Pik Le Ovde Hashem, chapter 10, page 194 to 186, also advises strongly against going to sudden extremes in precious and provides a very detailed program for gradual attainment of this trait. The gist of the program is to gradually wean oneself of any particular indulgence, taking small steps and making sure that one has gained a comfort, comfort level with each step before proceeding to the next. As an example, 
He advises that if one wishes to reduce indulgence in food, if one is accustomed to eating many tasty dishes at each meal, reduce them gradually. If there are five dishes, decrease them to four, and so on. Only when this is natural and not a hardship should one go on to the next step. So basically, take it one step at a time. Don't go and say, I'm just going to go to the highest level. You, nobody can do that with any of this, you know, with this whole program that the Ramchal has in here um, to with these traits. You know, you have to take each thing step by step and it, uh, implement them and then do it slowly, like with precious, with abstinence. It's very hard if you're used to indulging in so many things you know, again, this is me adding on to this. It's going to be very hard. Even like, even removing like gosh, things from your life, like I've done over the years, I've noticed. And I, I'm not even, I have no interest in them. TV, movies, magazines, radio, all these things. Just what it is is when you start adding in more of the spiritual, the ruchnias, that other stuff becomes like, like he said earlier in this chapter, it doesn't even. You don't feel deprived. I don't feel like I'm missing out on anything. Movies, all these other things that people do that I couldn't care less. Videos, you know, video games. Whatever. It just, you, what it is, is your whole, you shift so you're, it has no interest. It doesn't even, it's like, you, you can't understand how people would be interested in that. It's just nonsense, right? A lot of it's poison too for the, for the soul. Okay, so that is uh, the end of this chapter and there is a summary here now. So the summary of chapter 15. The most effective way to acquire precious is to internalize the idea that indulging in physical pleasure is simply not worthwhile. On the surface, these pleasures seem very attractive, but that is largely an illusion. In reality, the enjoyment that provi they provide is far less than one imagines. And whatever good feeling there is dissipates in short order and is soon forgotten. What is more, um, what is more indulging in physical pleasures can be harmful to the body as well as the soul. Training oneself to think this way gradually weakens one desi one's desires for these pleasures and greatly eases the task of avoiding them whenever they are not necessary for one's well-being. Because the sight of pleasurable things stimulates one's imagination and excites one's desire, a person attempting to acquire this trait must take care to avoid seeing pleasurable objects and activities. In this regard, the best preventive measure is to seclude oneself as much as possible from people who cherish such things and even from broader society as a whole. Finally, just as precious in general is not for everyone, as explained in chapter 13, so too, not every level of precious is appropriate for everyone aspiring to this trait. Extreme care must be taken to proceed slowly in withdrawing from physical pleasures. To do otherwise is a recipe for failure. So again, it's taking it at the stage that you're at, that you're able to, like you said, you're able to, to, to deal with it and not feel like deprived because then you might end up going the other way. And I hope and pray that we will all merit to live and see the coming of Mashiach speedily in our days and the rebuilding of our final and everlasting Beit HaMegdash. Amen and thanks for watching.